I never write again that I never tip my hat to the crowd. <laughs> because today, I tip my hat to all the people in New England. Welcome back to Weekend Scoreboard. I'm Mike Crispino. For the past 19 years, the Bruins have failed to return to those championship heights of 1972. They fell short again this year, but they provided some tremendous thrills and the kind of hockey that continues to fill this ancient sports shrine, the Boston Garden. Let's take a look back now at some of those great memories of 1990-91. The Bruins season began in October with the raising of hopes and another Wales Conference banner. It marked the homecoming of longtime nemesis Chris Nyland, who took no time at all making himself comfortable in his new surroundings. The Bruins broke out of the gate in grand fashion, winning their first four games of the young season. But they were about to get a taste of reality. In the midst of a seven-game road trip, the Bees fell apart. They went winless in five straight, including back-to-back 8-1 -to defeats in Edmonton and Calgary. They limped home, beaten, confused, and dejected. It was bad. It was bad. It was uh, terrible, in fact. I'm not even mad. I, I'm kind of sad about it. There's something. I don't just, uh, just, it's a dilemma. At this point, uh, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen. I mean, you're always thinking they're going to make some moves, but, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's out of our hands right now. Real men did wear black, but Mike Milbury had to go back to the drawing board several times to find out how many. Inconsistency was one of the trademarks of the 1990-91 Bruins. But so was tenacity and courage, two qualities that symbolized Bruins teams throughout the years. Once again, the Bruins demonstrated that they could dish it out as well as take it. They were a lunch bucket crew sprinkled with superstars, with no one player greater than the whole. This team produced a variety of heroes. Over the line now. Nearly holding. Puts it in front for backhander. Tip and a score! Donnie Sweeney. Don Sweeney gives the Bruins the victory 5-4 in sudden death overtime. In comes Bob Sweeney. Cam Neely's in front of the net. He's parked there. Neely's trying to get there. Sweeney in front, shoots and scores! And the Bruins, with one of the few chances they've had in overtime, won it. For Janney. Janney. But Bob Sweeney may break in. Bob Sweeney in. Overtime! Score, Byron! Byron scores, and the Bruins win it! long into the season that the Bruins were back on their usual perch on top of the Adams division. But of course, there were moments of frustration. Just ask Cam Neely, the Bruins' marked man who caught a five-game suspension for his outburst, or Mike Milbury, who couldn't control his team one night or his temper the next. You know, I'm getting a little sick of this as one incident. One little time we, we go over the edge. I mean, every time I turn around, you guys are all over us for lack of discipline. I mean, I think you guys ought to look in the mirror and find out how you guys want us to play. When you guys figure it out, let me know so I can tell them. Well, we all have our moments, I guess. But let's talk about a constant a combination of Cam Neely and Craig Janney, two guys who people pay to see night in and night out. In 1990-91, the dynamic duo was nothing short of sensation. Bruins clear it out.
it to Janney. Janney will bring it up. Janney in. Janney the move. Janney the shot and a goal. Janney comes back. But Neely, Neely knocks it down. Backhand scores. Neely from Janney number 40. If Neely and Janney can be considered the dynamic duo, then certainly Ray Bork was the Lone Ranger. His stints of longevity on the ice have become legendary. In his own quiet way, Bork led by example all year long. In true Bruin style, the backbone of the team was the leader on the blue line. And once again, that man was Raymond Bork. Kicked in by Bork. Bork goes to the corner near the net. Between the pipes, Mike Milbury looked for one of his two goaltenders to get hot and carry the load for the Bees. And while both Andy Moog and Reggie Lemlin had their moments of splendor, it was the exploits of number 35 that left the echoes of Moog thundering through the garden rafters most often. Is it away now? There may be no other sport which is so punishing to the human body than professional hockey. And so it was, as it is every year, that a number of Bruins would be lost to injury. This year's stories were both poignant and painful. There was the crushing loss of Bobby Carpenter to the backboards of the Montreal Forum, apparently lost for the year before miraculously resurfacing in game two of the playoffs. And Gordy Kluzak, at one time a number one draft pick overall in the NHL, said goodbye to the sport he loved so much after countless knee operations. The only part of me that <clears throat> is really happy about this decision is my left knee. The rest of me is torn by it. But my left knee <clears throat> is uh, very thankful that I've made this decision. Like Gord Kluzak's career, the Bruins season ended much too soon for their fans' liking. After 13 thrilling games with the Whalers and the Canadians, they simply ran out of gas against a better Pittsburgh Penguins team. That series ended a season full of hope for the Boston Bruins, but they left us plenty to remember. Neely with it, has control, wheels in the zone, cuts back along, shot saved, loose puck, shot saved, Neely had two, shot scores, Kim Neely, you can't give him three, and Neely makes it six to three. Bob Sweeney gets it. Wheels in the zone. Bob Sweeney comes, cuts it flat.